Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. Our biologists were noticing huge declines in the Marfa area. They started calling landowners and then they started, oh yeah, we saw five dead here, four dead there. They're doing this just to get some experience doing research and they spend a considerable amount of time on this. We go out one night a week and it takes basically from seven until midnight and they also have to learn all these frog calls. And this is where I come to fish, catch catfish. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks, Guts, Glory, Ram. They're an icon of the plains. Pronghorn antelopes still roam the grasslands of West Texas, but in the last three years, pronghorn populations have plummeted. Our biologists were noticing huge declines in the Marfa area. They started calling landowners, and then they started, oh yeah, we, we saw five dead here, four dead there. And we blamed a lot of that on the drought, but we began to get rains and watch the antelope continue to decline, and then we knew we had a problem. Yeah. One clue may be a tiny stomach worm showing up in record numbers in West Texas pronghorn. One blood worm can take as much as one-tenth of a cc of blood a day, but if you have thousands of these worms in your stomach, then obviously you, you become anemic, you, uh, you're, you're weakened, uh, you're not going to evade uh, predators and cold spells and heat spells like, like you would if, if you were a more healthy animal. To investigate the case, scientists are turning to area landowners and hunters for help. I think the pronghorn antelope is beautiful. I'm not going to see those in Florida. I'm ready. You're ready? Yep. And once the animal is harvested, and we will basically be doing a necropsy on the animal and extracting various uh, samples from that animal. This is a kidney. Bucks may be hunted for nine days by permit only. This narrow hunting window provides the perfect opportunity for collecting tissue samples for analysis. It sounds counterintuitive that someone that actually hunts these animals also wants to protect their well-being. Hunters are very much in favor of conservation to help both not only the animal but the habitat in which the animal lives. The hunters and the landowners uh, have, have played a, a huge role. We basically couldn't do any of this research without them. From the field, the samples go to the lab for analysis. Great smell. As scientists search for Great answers, smell. folks in West Texas rally to preserve this true native Texan. A lot of the ranchers, hunters, wildlife uh, enthusiasts view pronghorn is that it's an icon of the West, a flagship for grasslands. They've been part of the landscape before we were here. Hopefully they'll be here after we're gone. And as stewards of the land here, I, I just can't sit by and not try to do something. Just 50 miles east of Dallas, Lake Tawakini State Park offers more than great sunsets. It's an escape from the hustle and bustle of city life. Sounds kind of hokey, but, but really, it's just a, a clean family place to be. And this is where I come to fish, catch catfish. I usually just hop on the trail over there and walk down to the point. It's where I bring my grandbabies. They love it out here. There's five miles of shoreline for fishing, bait in the general store, a cleaning station if you're lucky enough to need it, and a four-lane boat ramp that makes it easy to get out on the water. During the summertime, we'll come out here and try to catch stripers or That's good, Rich. hybrids and sand bass. So we'll get done fishing and 
park the boat right here and walk right up the trail, 50 yards right straight to our campsite. Some folks pitch a tent. Others can plug in their RV at the 50 ant hookups and settle in for the evening. We have a giant marshmallow factory around here. There you go. Yeah, we found two more trails. Five miles of hiking and biking trails wind through trees and open out to the shore. And interpretive led hikes are a great way to learn more about the outdoors. Get down low. And get a closer look at nature. Dig through here, see if you see any insects. Yeah, ooh, what is that? Leaf bug. Fabulous place to bird watch all year round. You've got shorebirds, forest birds, and a lot of prairie birds too. It's fun to watch them. One of our best raptors is the osprey. There's all kinds of wildlife here. And just getting to see some of those animals in nature, wow. that's something that they're gonna cherish their whole life. And hopefully they'll learn how to be stewards of the land and be able to help preserve this area out here. Thanks to some dedicated volunteers, there will one day be a prairie to explore at this park. Wow. We're trying to restore the prairie. Wow. And we have a lot of Boy Scouts that come out here and help us. Over the years, invasive plants have crowded out the native grasses. We're clearing out some of the trees that have infested this prairie land so that they can get some nice prairie grass, maybe even restore some of the more rare plants in this area. Good family place. The comments we get are, this is a beautiful park. We'll be back. It's amazing how much life and activity there is going on out there at night when most of us are home watching television. Oh. Kathy McCormick is going out for an evening stroll in the suburbs, but tonight she's gearing up for an important watch program, checking on the welfare of some neighborhood residents. All right. Tonight, Kathy is looking out for frogs and toads in the creek just behind her house as a volunteer of the Texas Amphibian Watch Program. It's a way for citizens to get involved in monitoring the frogs and toads in their neighborhood. Tonight, I'm gonna to be doing my monitoring of Honey Bear Creek. I just walk out the back door and listen and record how many species of frogs and toads you hear calling and provide that data into uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife. The water level, I would say, is average. Sky is cloudy. And the background noise is medium. After collecting some basic information, amphibian watchers don't so much watch as listen. And wait. Well, we've been out here for half an hour, and uh, no frogs calling so far on this very cold night. The weather is very changeable in the spring. It doesn't look like there's gonna be any frogs out tonight. This creek is quiet because of a late cold snap, but globally, amphibian populations are falling silent for other reasons. It all started back in 1989 when scientists at a conference started comparing notes and finding out that they were seeing declines in amphibians in many different localities, but really alarming decreases in amphibian populations. And then we added to this in the mid-1990s populations of frogs that seemed to have a really alarming rate of malformations, things like extra legs or extra eyes or missing limbs. And so together, those sort of indicators made us wonder if something was going on globally, some sort of broad environmental change that was affecting our amphibians. Well, nobody really knows, and the basic problem is, is that there's uh, no baseline data. In other words, there's no data for, for most of these amphibians prior to when people started to notice problems. We want to know how frogs and toads in Texas are doing and what kind of factors might be causing their decline. So I think it's really valuable research. For biology professor Ben Pierce, Texas Amphibian Watch provides important data about amphibian health 
while giving his students an opportunity to do real field work. They're doing this just to get some experience doing research, uh, and we're interested in being involved in this particular project. <laughs> and they spend a considerable amount of time on this. We go out one night a week, and it takes basically from 7 until midnight, and they also have to learn all these frog calls. So after the rest of their campus has settled down for the night, Ben and his students are just getting started, hitting the road to listen at rural wetlands for frogs and toads. It's a great way to sample the environment for the presence of frogs. Texas Parks and Wildlife provides a randomly selected route, and uh, we stop at wetlands where frogs might be present. All right. We take a lot of precautions to be safe when we stop. Don't get on private property, but uh, many of these frog calls you can hear a considerable distance away. And uh, we listen for five minutes and record any frog calls we hear and also the approximate number of frogs that are calling. Okay, that's our five minutes. We have 10 stops on this route. So we'll go to the next stop. I just don't think there's much out here tonight. Hopefully we'll be able to hear more in the next few stops. Frogs and toads tend to be fairly secretive animals. They're really obvious only during the, uh, the spring and summer when most of them breed. And the rest of the year, they're, they're pretty hidden from view. The male frogs and toads are actually the ones that do the calling. And when conditions are right, when temperatures are right, and rainfall or humidity has been right, the male frog or toad will go to a wetland, and those males will congregate and start to emit a call that's unique to that particular species trying to attract the females to come to the pond or the, the puddle and hoping then that the female will come and the males will have the chance to fertilize the female's eggs when they are laid. In Texas, there are about 30 species of salamanders and about 40 species of frogs and toads. So we really have a rich uh, diversity of amphibians in the state. For many of these species, we have very little information about how abundant they are and how they naturally increase or decrease over time. And so it's really difficult to know what kinds of things might be causing decreases in amphibians. There's lots of ideas, but there's no one single factor. It seems to be that it's interaction of complex things where maybe the habitat is changing, the climate is changing, and amphibians are kind of suffering the consequences. Amphibians have a very permeable skin, and so many people have speculated that they may be particularly good indicators of environmental damage. There's the problem with the ultraviolet radiation, indication that some chemicals are having effects on some populations. Habitat, of course, is, a, is an issue, but again, you can't draw any conclusions without some data. You can just tell us if you find gray tree frogs that it was a gray tree frog species. But, but each year, more and more amphibian watchers learn how to collect that data. This is the Cope's gray tree frog. We've got training sessions or workshops. We've got a CD. People have heard frog and toad sounds, but perhaps they never knew what they were hearing at night. So the CD can help with that. The northern cricket frog, Acris crepitans. Now with Texas Amphibian Watch, we've got about 150 different sampling sites. And so when data comes in from points like that all over the state, we're able to get a, a pretty nice picture of what's going on. Well, definitely over there, you can hear about maybe two to three northern cricket frogs. Later that night, the roadside survey gets hopping. Yeah, that's probably southern leopard frog. That down there, I'm pretty sure, was a bullfrog. We heard cricket frogs at almost every stop, and we've heard leopard frogs at the last, what, three that's or four three. stops. I so, think so. Uh, we heard actually quite a few frogs out tonight. No, Ooh. there he was. Not anymore. I think that was the one that was a leopard frog, I think. Well, we actually got to see some frogs. That was good. Whether from roadside counts, adopting backyard ponds or creeks, or reporting amphibian That's sightings and malformations. Green tree frog. That's the information the Texas amphibian answer. watchers collect will ultimately benefit frogs and toads uh, everywhere. A bullfrog. <laughs>
the Houston toad is considered to be endangered, primarily we think due to loss of habitat over time. We know we've lost one frog species. The northern leopard frog used to occur on the very edge of Texas out in El Paso County. But the initial news for most Texas amphibians could be worse. We know some of them are in habitats that are threatened, like some of our spring-dwelling salamanders, but uh, we don't see the alarming trends we've seen in some places around the world. You know, they've been busy. And the trend of concerned citizens like Kathy McCormick Look looking out for wildlife is very encouraging. There's a whole bunch of them right here. I think these are northern cricket frog tadpoles because they're very little and a Rio Grande leopard frog tadpole. He just wiggled. Woo, look at them all. We really value the extra eyes and ears. Okay, now look at that and one. volunteer yeah. eyes and ears yeah. are assisting in other citizen monitoring programs. I think this is really fun. I think it's very interesting. Texas nature trackers keep tabs on freshwater mussels, horned lizards, monarch butterflies, and many other animals in addition to amphibians. I think that we have a moral obligation to preserve for future generations some of what's wild and natural within the state. We have to be cognizant of their susceptibility to declines. I think we have to really work at making sure that we provide the habitats that support them. But I am hopeful about frogs. I think that my grandchildren will one day get to go out and listen to the same frogs that I hear today. That's my hope anyway. trying to build uh, space shuttles and army trucks. That's my previous jobs. <sighs> Engineering work is fun, but riding bikes and giving them away and helping out little kids is a lot more fun. I mean, going from extreme north to extreme south at 15 miles an hour, you see a lot. Sometimes a lot of nothing, but it's always a lot. <laughs> Tom Rupakis is riding the hand cycle. Got you another hill coming up. Ronnie Witt follows in the van. These two guys are biking across the United States, raising money to buy hand cycles for children with disabilities. Kingsville. Cool. Since the beginning of their trip, Tom and Ronnie have traveled 1,850 miles. I don't know how many times two guys in wheelchairs ever rode a bike across the United States. It might be a first. I don't know. There's what I thought was going to be the town, Ron. <laughs> oh, that's about what, like all the other towns we've been going by and missing. <laughs> Pretty morning. Love bugs in the air. Tom has been training for this trip for three and a half years, riding his bike every day spending endless hours at the gym, strengthening his upper body. In the process, he's lost over 100 pounds and gained a whole new life. Hi, good to meet you. What's your name? Martin Salinas. Hi, and yours? Sonia Salinas. Sonia, very nice to meet you, too. This is my bike. I've been riding this across the United States, all the way from Canada. And this whole ride that I'm doing is to raise money to uh, buy bikes for disabled children. Mm -hmm. And we've bought one bike and uh, given it out to a child already, and I'll tell you, there's nothing like being able to do that. We've uh, 50 miles today, boy, oh boy. Ronnie, is my cushion up there? Has it got a cover on it? Like I tell everybody, I still don't consider myself an athlete. I've got my dedication into it, but I also, Look at my limitations and my realities. Hey, hey that's cheating. Yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> it's the second to last day of the trip, and Tom and Ronnie are joined by friends who provide some much needed moral support. Do we go over the bridge or do we go around it? There's a breakdown lane, right? Yeah, oh yeah. We go over. All 
three of these guys share a tragic bond. Each ended up in a wheelchair following motorcycle accidents. Back in 1980, I was going home from uh, work one night. My shield fogged up on my helmet and I couldn't see. Went off the road on my side, then all the way off the other side. Had a little wreck. It wasn't a serious uh, incident. My brother drove the motorcycle home, but it put me in the hospital for seven months. That was 20 years ago. It's made for a really handicapped person, as you can see. He got one leg. Yeah. How do you ride that bike with one leg, Todd? I just do it. Look, Ma, no hands. Oh, man, I would never be able to have this chance to do anything like this again, probably the rest of my life. I can't believe we're so close to finishing. I mean, I mean tomorrow it'll be done and over with. <laughs> the license plate on his hand cycle says it all. <laughs> this boy lives to ride. Hello. Meet Marcus Mann. What? Marcus is an energetic and somewhat precocious 11-year-old. He's also the first kid to receive a hand cycle, paid for by money raised from Tom and Ronnie's trip. That's what's getting in front of me. That's what's getting in front of me. You can see him. He's just having a great time. Uh, therapeutically, it's wonderful for him. Don't run us over! He gets his strength up. We get outside. He gets with social skills. Oh, it's just wonderful, though. Because he's so great. I mean, I have treated him for three years, and to see him get this, it's just great. <laughs> Marcus has muscular dystrophy, and an important part of his physical therapy is building a strong body. One, my upper body strength is stronger. Two, I, my social life is even better. And three, I don't know what three is. <laughs> The hand cycling made it a lot more funner. Not just, oh, I have to do this, but I want to do it because it's fun and it's helping my body out. But using muscles that I haven't used before, it's painful, but a painful in a good way. I'm gonna run you over, okay, Marcus? You don't mind? Yeah, I don't mind. <laughs> Ask your mom if you can come to Fuddruckers with us. Thank God we're almost done. You know, one thing people think we're, we're all just so awesome for doing it. No, we just want to get out there and do it. <laughs> we're just a normal person. But... We've had the insight of what we've had lost. Hey, look at that sign, Ronnie, Mexico. In a few hours, Tom and Ronnie will arrive at the Texas-Mexico border. Their 36-day, 2,000-mile journey will be finished. There'll be no cheering crowds awaiting them. No banners of congratulation. Oh, you shouldn't have. Oops, I... Just the knowledge they've accomplished something profoundly good. In this game, oh baby, oops, you big I'm not that innocent. For more information on activities for people with disabilities, you can contact an organization called Turning Point. Go to the Turning Point website.
This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.